so today um, I'm going to tell you about a project that um, was uh, started in my lab almost 20 years ago, but that actually had its origin even earlier when my lab was using the then new field of macromolecular NMR to study unusual DNA structures like uh, triplexes and quadruplexes. But before I do that, I want to take a minute to um, and let me get my laser pointer here um, to say just a few words about my um, history with the PDB, which uh, began a bit later than our previous speaker, but actually began um, in 1999 when Helen Berman uh, took over um, the uh, leadership of the uh, protein data bank, uh, leadership of this uh, collaboratory at that time, and invited me uh, to be on the scientific advisory board for the new PDB for my expertise in uh, nucleic acids, the orphans of the PDB, um, and macromolecular NMR. And over the years from that time, I really, um, so I was on the scientific advisory board and the NMR task force for the new PDB. Um, and I really come to admire Helen for uh, her courage, her tenacity and her, her vision and her discretion um, in running in super overviewing the overseeing the PDB without which uh, maybe we wouldn't be having this uh, meeting today. So as I mentioned, I first got interested in, um, well, I first got interested in telomerase when we started studying uh, the G-rich uh, repeat sequences that are found in uh, the telomeres at the ends of our chromosomes and which can associate to form inter or intramolecular uh, G quadruplexes. And what's shown here is one of the structures um, that I'm most proud of from my career uh, which was the first structure of a quadruplex and our first structure of a nucleic acid where we didn't really know what it was gonna uh, look like before we did the NMR. And uh, it had a, a, a quite, although it had the expected quartets, it had this quite unexpected topology where the thymines formed these diagonal loops um, and there were uh, uh, alternating syn anti-glycosidic torsion angles and also both parallel and anti-parallel uh, strands. So G, G quadruplexes with uh, different loop topologies uh, form readily under physiological conditions, and their um, roles in telomere biology and telomerase activity are still a subject today of investigation and debate. So what is telomerase? So telomerase is an RNA protein complex, an RNP, that extends the three prime ends of linear chromosomes. Um, and using all telomerases contain a unique telomerase reverse transcriptase called TERT and an integral telomerase RNA called TER. Um, and so this slide just illustrates kind of a end of a linear chromosome. And throughout the tel telomeric region, there are these repeats. This is the TT. G4 repeat found in um, tetrahymena telomerase, which will be the subject of most of my talk today. And at the three prime end, there is a single strand overhang of the telomeric repeat. Now, um, the way the enzyme works is that it contains an integral template. And this is really you know, the mechanism that was proposed back in 1985 by uh, Greider Carolyn Greider and Elizabeth Blackburn. So the, the end pairs up with an alignment region in the telomere repeat. And then um, the lights just went off in my office, <laughs> so I had to stand up. Um, and then the rest of the template is used to processively add a single telomere repeat. And then by um, unknown mechanism, the template itself translocates so that telomerase can processively synthesize multiple telomere repeats. So uh, this is the classic picture of how telomerase works. At some point, telomerase stops. DNA polymerase alpha primase has to come in and the C strand and synthesizes the C strand. And all of this has to happen in the presence 
of um, uh, telomere binding proteins that uh, form a complex both on the single strand end and on the double strand RNA to protect the ends of our uh, chromosomes from being detected as uh, double strand breaks and therefore being subject to um, DNA repair machinery. Now, why is telomerase of such enormous medical interest is because it's a highly regulated determinant of cellular aging, stem cell renewal, and tumorogenesis. And so contrary to what you might think, most of our somatic cells really have no telomerase activity. And in fact, uh, uh, every time our cells divide, our telomeres do get shorter until they reach a, a, a uh, such a short uh, 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 length where uh, cells then stop dividing and go into cellular senescence. However, uh, telomerase is active in stem cells, germline cells, and it's um, highly upregulated upreg in almost all cancers. And in fact, that increased telomerase activity is, um, is a, a prerequisite for the immortal phenotype of uh, cancer cells. And in fact, um, uh, mutations in the promoter region of the TERK protein are one of the most common mutations found in cancers. There are additional um, uh, number of diseases of telomerase inf insufficiency from mutations in the, both the protein and RNA components of telomerase. And these are some of the diseases. Pulmonary fibrosis is a really uh, common one. So, this is what most people think of when they think about telomerase. Uh, RNA is the template, but in fact, uh, there's a lot more to telomerase RNA than just the template. And the rest of that um, RNA is important uh, for activity and assembly. And so in our early, when we first started working on telomerase, um, we were doing NMR and nucleic acids, and, and really our goal was to figure out what that other RNA was doing using a structure uh, function approach. But one of the confusions for a long time uh, was that, you know, that the RNA is quite varied in length among different species, but um, eventually it became clear that there was uh, two conserved regions, the template pseudonaut domain, this big circle here, and then another domain, which I'm illustrating on uh, tetrahymena, um, that together are important for activity. And so we focused our early efforts on these pseudonauts. And I've just listed some of the, the papers uh, from where, uh, where we studied um, our, the RNA structures or RNA protein uh, complexes. And, um, and then uh, in the next slide, I, I'll sh I show you our first, the first really significant part of, the, of a a domain of telomerase RNA that we solved, which is the human telomerase RNA pseudonaut that's uh, shown here on the cover of uh, Molecular Cell in 2005. And one of the surprising features of this pseudonaut is that uh, with the loop that uh, forms, the loops that form part of the uh, pseudonauts are actually binding, um, especially uh, here in the major groove to form a major groove triple helix. And this was quite unexpected that that could happen. So this was the first report of an RNA major groove triple helix, but now they've shown up in um, all kinds of other RNAs, uh, very commonly in riboswitches, for instance. So this is a picture uh, that's evolved now um, from uh, st our structure, ours and other structural studies um, where, uh, the template pseudonaut domain and this other domain uh, interact uh, with the TERT. Um, and uh, although all these different organisms have this very confusing array of proteins, um, uh, we, defined, we defined the telomerase uh, core RMP as TERT, TERT, TER, and other TER binding proteins. However, um, other proteins can either transiently or constitutively associate with the core RMP um, uh, to recruit and tether telomerase to telomeres or for C-strand synthesis. 
the, so the next slide, uh, this slide illustrates that uh, in the better studied human system. And uh, this is our, what we call our planet telomerase view of, of telomerase, which you'll understand as I go through the talk. But um, this Shelterin complex that binds actually throughout the telomere uh, has these two proteins, TPP1 and POT1. POT1 binds the single strand telomeric DNA and TPP1 uh, associates with TERT, specifically binds TERT to activate it, to recruit it and activate it for uh, activity um, for extending this telomere end. And then there's another set of proteins, this uh, heterotrimer called uh, CST, that eventually stops the activity of, of telomerase, recruits pole alpha primase for C strand synthesis. And all of these proteins likely evolved from the really important replication protein A uh, that's involved in all aspects of DNA replication and repair. So in uh, 2013, uh, we published our first structure of a telomerase holoenzyme, tetrahymena telomerase. And we started uh, focus our efforts on, on tetrahymena because it was the best uh, defined uh, telomerase at that time. And uh, our collaborator, Kathy Collins, had identified seven proteins and the one RNA. So this is what a 25 angstrom negative uh, stain uh, EM uh, map looked like. Um, and of course, not very informative by itself, but um, we had strains from Kathy Collins that had affinity tags on um, all of the proteins and the RNA individually. And using this information <clears throat> and other information that we uh, got, uh, we were able to uh, locate uh, all of, almost all of the proteins. This was the only one that where we couldn't find the tag um, and, uh, and see where they were uh, located. So, uh, so for instance, we had a crystal structure of part of the RNA bound to part of this protein P65, which is uh, a law-related protein important for assembly. And because we have the tag there, we knew where its C-terminal end was. So uh, this is that core RMP I showed you, TER, TER, and P65. And then the only other protein anything was known about was TEB1. This is only the C domain is seen here, but it was uh, identified by the Collins Lab as a um, paralog of the large subunit of replication protein A, and it was also shown to bind telomeric DNA. So then there's this other complex, 75, 45, 19, that was completely structurally and functionally uncharacterized. And P50 was actually thought, based on um, Silverstein jaws, to be a substoichiometric, but in fact, it's right here in the middle, contacting TER, TEB1, and uh, this three protein complex. So that was in uh, 2013. And then uh, two years later, and um, about seven people years later, uh, we were able to get uh, our first cryolium structure um, at just under 10 angstroms. So that's uh, shown here with the catalytic core and so on. And um, one of the problems that we had and that we continue to have is that uh, dynamics, right? This and, and this um, RNP is highly dynamic. And in particular, this uh, trimeric complex is hinging as a unit around uh, P50. These are just a bunch of class averages. Um, but you can also see that there's a lot of dynamics going on uh, down here. And so this has made this, um, I mean, throughout the rest of the enzyme. So this has made this a really uh, challenging RNP. Um, and so uh, we actually uh, masked out uh, this, uh, this complex, and this is now a backside view, so uh, it looks different, but we were able to get the resolution a little bit better under nine angstroms. So on this slide, um, and now I'm showing the reverse view, I'm going to summarize really uh, what I mentioned about seven person years of uh, 
of work that went into figuring out uh, where everything is what, and what everything is and modeling into the complex. So uh, we were able to model the core RNP uh, using um, either uh, structures or homology uh, structures of, of the uh, domains of the proteins, uh, homology models, uh, domains of the RNA. And um, here is the active site. And then here is where that other protein tab, tab one, the C domain of tab one that I actually, we actually thought was here from the negative stain. But it, as we uh, tried to figure out what was going on here, we realized that there were no proteins that we knew of that could fit in there. So um, you may have noticed in the previous slide, I said nine proteins. And what we realized, what we thought, reasoned was that, okay, we have this paralog of the large subunit, maybe the other subunits are there. And so we just uh, use the model of the heterotrimeric fold, uh, three OB domains of replication A, and sure enough, it fit into the density. And then we confirmed that these proteins were present by mass spec. Now it also turned out that there was another RPA. We could, we could also fit, uh, so this, this is um, uh, TEB1, and like POT1, uh, it binds the telomeric DNA and has a dependence, its activity uh, enhancement is dependent on P50. So as I started to say, we also found that that same trimeric complex could fit uh, in another place on the, on the, um, on the enzyme. And uh, this was also consistent with the crystal structure we had of P19 and the C-terminal C domain of P45, which isn't visible here. And so this is that, um, that uh, 75, 19 complex that we proposed uh, was maybe equivalent to CST. And then here's P50 that we proposed might be acting like TPP1. But of course, uh, this was our proposal at the time and a little bit, um, you know, reaching. But um, so, the next slide just shows those uh, some of those other domains that we don't see. This one we saw by NMR, this one by crystallography. Um, so there's, we always uh, still need those other methods. And I just mostly showed this just to emphasize um, that because we have these proteins that are constitutively associated with the core uh, RNP of telomerase, we have this unique uh, ability um, a unique model system in tetrahymena where we can not only look at the catalytic core, but also uh, get information about how telomerase might interact at telomeres. So I'm just going to spend um, uh, a couple minutes to tell you how uh, we modeled the, um, the catalytic core. So here it is, or the RNP core, so the, including P65. Um, so at the time, there was a structure of a protein called beetle tert, flower beetle tert, um, and that we now call the tert-like protein um, because it's, we really don't think it's a genuine tert, as I'll show you. But it's been a tremendous, uh, tremendously useful for think, for modeling telomerase structure. Uh, so it has an RNA binding domain, uh, the reverse transcriptase domain, which is the palm and fingers, and the CTE, which is the thumb, and then, uh, but it's lacking. Um, this telomerase essential and terminal domain, the RB, RBD, TRBD is shorter, and it turns out also to have a big difference um, in the RT. There was also a crystal structure of the RBD domain and a crystal structure of this telomerase uh, essential and terminal domain, and R and MR structures and uh, uh, one crystal structure of RNA protein complex. So we were able to fit those in and connect them and make them model. So I just want to show you a couple things we learned from this, um, which is um, that we then just looking at where this stem loop two was uh, wrapping its single strands around the TRBD, we could propose how the temp how the enzyme knew when it had reached the end of the template. So it's just simply an anchor on the enzyme, and then somehow the template has to translocate back, which we didn't know anything about. So this is called the template boundary element. And the other thing is, since I talked about the pseudonaut, 
Here you can see uh, the pseudonaut um, on the back side, far away from the active site on the other side where the three uh, catalytic uh, spartates are. And so uh, we propose that the telomerase RNA, um, uh, the pseudonaut acts as a watch band ratchet clasp in uh, the ultimate assembly of the enzyme. So, um, so then finally, three years later, we got down to 4.8 angstrom cryo-EM structure. And importantly, now we have uh, telomeric uh, DNA there. And um, again, we needed, uh, this was quite challenging. Um, and I just want to point out, so we spent, you know, like more than half a year uh, trying to bootstrap our way through modeling at this resolution. It's quite difficult, but we were able to, um, to um, you know, have little um, landmarks of large uh, amino acid side chains that gave us confidence that we had the backbones at least in the right position. But for P50, we could only get uh, put in uh, alanines and we weren't even confident about the fold. So I'm going to show you um, a little movie here about this structure. So uh, this is that tert ring from the flower beetle tert with its RVD, RT, uh, CTE domains. And within the TERT ring, there are these motifs, T motif, motif three, and these insertion, two helices from this insertion and fingers domain that were thought to be unique to TERT, but in fact are found in um, several other reverse transcriptases. So now um, you'll see overlaid the structure that uh, uh, within the EM map of the RBD, the, um, uh, the RT and the CTE. And for the most part, they overlay pretty well. The RBD has some extra, TRBD has some extra stuff that is actually essential for um, its activities. Um, but, uh, and here are the three catalytic aspartates. But if you put this in the context of the entire um, uh, cryo-EM map, and then you replace the 10 domain for which there was a crystal structure, it's like sitting out here pretty far away from this turt ring, which never made much sense. But then we realize that there's this whole uh, long linker between those two helices that um, uh, we had been thought to be unstructured, but here you can see it forms this very well-defined interface with the 10 domain. And so we called this the trap, partially because uh, it surrounds this, uh, on the other side of this RNA kind of uh, trapping it in there, and it's important for the uh, activity. So here you can just see this template pseudonaut domain with the pseudonaut uh, wrapping around uh, the tert ring. Um, and then at the bottom is this stem loop four that inserts between this um, RBD and the CTE, and here's the DNA coming out. So I, this is just illustrated again here, and you can also see that this complex is sitting on top of the tert ring, and you can see this extensive interface between the trap and the 10 domain. So this structure also uh, illustrated for us um, why it's so difficult to assemble uh, tert and tert in vitro, because you have this series of uh, interlocks that um, the um, template pseudonaut domain uh, is this big circle that, racks, that wraps up, um, around the tert ring. And then stem loop four closes the CTE and R RBD together. But then you have the trap reaching down over that, um, that uh, template pseudonaut domain. And the 10 domain, which is connected by a flexible linker to the RBD reaching up from the bottom, so kind of physically uh, enclosing the, um, the RNA. And here's the DNA coming out and that linker between 10 and RBD we can't really see. So this is where we were in uh, 2018 with these uh, three structures from which we had learned a tremendous amount with a little help from NMR and X-ray, actually a lot. And I'm very excited to tell you today for the very first time that we now uh, have a paper coming out in Nature, Impressive Nature, Structure of Telomerase at, and they changed our original title, 
Uh, so we have several structures, including uh, different steps of telomere repeat synthesis, including one at 3.3 angstroms at the second step, where we can really get a complete model, including the side chains of uh, the entire uh, enzyme, except for the CST, which isn't shown here. So we have this 3.3 angstrom uh, structure, the 4.8 angstrom structure I just showed you, but we've refined it a little more, and then 4.4 .4 and 3.8. So four different steps. So let me just show you that structure. You can see the beautiful um, density, and uh, you can see uh, the RNA wrapping around um, and where all the uh, proteins are. And then here, you can see we also uh, were able to model more of P65. So here is the TERT ring, that trap, and ten domain. So here's the back side, the other side of the TERT ring. And um, now we're going to zoom in on uh, the DNA. And I just want to make this important point that the DNA only has four base pairs to the template, even though for this particular sequence, it could have had five. So there are four DNA RNA base pairs. And the DNA has moved out of the active site. So um, here, uh, it's waiting for a new nucleotide to come in. The other three structures have the base pair in the active site. So here's another little movie um, showing uh, how the RNA uh, interacts uh, uh, with, with, the, with the TERT. So um, here is stem loop two. Here is the active site side, and all of this highlighted RNA is important for defining the template boundaries. Um, and um, the orange RNA is actually uh, fixed on the, on the CTE. And then here is the pseudonaut on the back. And here is the stem loop four. And we're not showing uh, the P65 here, but just loop four uh, inserting between the CTE and the RBD, which uh, P65 helps it to do. So I'm almost at the end here. So I just want to show you a few things that we learned, just a few of the many things we learned. One is I told you we could finally model um, P50, and it is surprisingly similar. So even though it's an OB, OB fold and we expected it to be an OB fold, because of the sequence uh, is so different, uh, we couldn't model it. Uh, so now we have. Uh, uh, de novo. So now we have the, the actual structure. And even like this loop here, uh, even with different um, sequence, it actually forms the same fold. And so we could superimpose this on human. We can see that th that P50 is interacting with the 10 domain and the trap domain in the same way um, uh, with the same part of the, of the OB fold that was predicted to interact uh, with uh, TERT based on uh, uh, biochemical studies. And obviously you need these two domains in a true TERT because you can't get binding to TPP1 and therefore recruitment without tenon trap. Here's the DNA in the active site. So the DNA, um, here's the template, here's the DNA. And uh, then it comes out and it travels to this uh, C shape on uh, TEB1, which uh, is probably the equivalent of uh, POT1. And what was really exciting here is that this binding is uh, quite weak to this domain. So if you try to look at it in vitro, you can't. And now we can see the specific interactions of uh, these three Gs on the, on the surface of TAB1, including um, recognition of one of the Gs by three uh, hydrogen bonds to amino acids on the enzyme, on TAB1 rather. So finally, um, so we have these four different structures. This is the highest resolution structure. And this was this, this is the, sorry, this is the second highest resolution structure. And for all of the structures, if it's post-nucleotide translocation, there's four bases in the, um, that pair with the template. And if it's uh, pre-nucleotide translocation, this base in the active site, it's five. So there's always five, four or five base pairs throughout telomere repeat synthesis. Um, and uh, we uh, identified a conserved a, a bridge loop on the RNA binding domain that uh, helps flip 
this DNA basis out, stacks on the DNA bases, and also at the same time uh, stacks and interacts at the top. So, and then the RNA just continues as a, con it's just a continuous eight nucleotide RNA stack. So, uh, so without showing you all the structural data, um, we had a lot of time in the last, uh, during COVID to think deeply about what these structures were telling us. And so if you look at the top uh, half here, here's uh, our proposal for how, how the uh, RNA and, and protein interacts for, an, for the nucleotide, six steps of nucleotide translocation. And then uh, we also uh, propose how uh, the template uh, translocates for tel telomere repeat translocation. And I just want to make one point, which is that we always thought about that this step as you know some big energy that was required to separate the uh, the DNA from the template because we always thought of it as a longer DNA RNA duplex as it extended. But in fact, it's only you know four or five base pairs. And so, in fact, I think the question is really holding what holds the DNA and RNA together rather than um, more than what pulls them apart. So with that, I just uh, like to acknowledge the amazing uh, people I've had in my lab that were brave enough to, uh, to tackle this uh, then impossible uh, project. Uh, early work uh, was done in collaboration with the Collins Lab um, and our EM work has been done with, uh, in collaboration with Hangzhou at UCLA. And in fact, uh, Jensen uh, was a share postdoc. Um, and all these people in green are gone. The current brave souls working on this project are these four guys and I, um, who have done a fantastic job. And I especially uh, want to mention Yao He, who uh, really uh, did all of the cryo EM and a huge amount of biochemistry for the uh, last work that I just talked about today. So people have left the lab and we haven't been able to bring new people in the lab. So if you're interested in working on really exciting and interesting um, RMPs besides just telomerase, um, we're hiring, so please apply. And with that, I'll stop. And I guess I should stop share. Um. So Julie, I really, really want to thank you for this talk. It's, it was a, you deserve the courage as well. It's extraordinary. But can I ask you, I really, one question. Um, you mentioned that from seeing these structures, it's completely clear why it was difficult to get the tur, tur, the tur complex in vitro. But isn't it about as difficult for the cell to make it in vivo? How does that happen? Yeah, this is this uh, the assembly question is something uh, we have spent an uh, extraordinary amount of time um, thinking about, working on. Um, we do have some publications with proposals there. And um, I didn't talk about the what P65 is doing, but uh, it is uh, contributing uh, to that assembly. Um, and another time. <laughs> okay, I mean, I know it's not the focus of the talk, but it just seemed to me about as difficult in vivo as it would be in vitro. Well, so except was a... in vivo, you have, uh, you know, you have chaperones and things like that. Um, you know, you don't, it's a different situation in the cell, right? It's crowded. You always have in, this, in, this, in the cell. Yeah. All right. So, so one, one of the participants asked a question. The, the first G-quad structures in the PDB are from the 90s, but all of them were, were from NMR, right? When did the first G-quad structure determined by crystallography to be deposited? Do you know? I don't remember the year. I think the, well, OK, sorry. <laughs> there was actually published concurrently with the NMR structure that I showed you. There was another paper in Nature. Ours was a letter. Alex Rich, my former uh, PhD mentor, also had a structure 
uh, in an article in Nature, um, which had different loop conformations. That's right. And uh, it took about 10 years, but it, 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 uh, they, they mismodeled that particular structure. However, the loop conformations that they saw are present in some other, um, other quadruplexes. Um, so uh, the first correct one, I think, was from uh, David Lilly. It's been a long time. <laughs> <laughs> but it was all so, that, that, it, so and they can form different structures depending whether it's sodium or potassium uh, chelated in in the center um we're getting a message that we need to move on. <laughs> one more one more question first very nice structures what gave you the strong spring in resolution to 3.3 angstroms better prep or better microscopes or better computers or better scientists i'd add <laughs> Uh, it was a combination of things, uh, uh, better prep, both uh, in terms of purification, in terms of um, grids, um, and better uh, data processing, more particles. So it was a combination of, of things. So anyway, I really thank you very, very much. It was, it was spectacular.